Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's 11th March. Oppenheimer just won the Best Picture Oscar and it's time for some more Deep Space updates. And we look back at the rocket launches, there have been hundreds of payloads put into orbit and they have all flown on Falcon 9s. Starting on March 4th, when we had Crew 8 carrying Matthew Dominic, Michael Barrett and Jeanette Epps and a Roscosmos astronaut, Alexander Grabenkin. This means that now we've had over 50 people fly on the Dragon spacecraft. That's more than the number that flew on the Apollo spacecraft. But, you know, Dragon does have a long way to go before it catches up with the space shuttle or Soyuz. Now, during this launch, during the closeout, there was one minor concern over... Uh, a hatch seal which uh, showed a small crack in closeout photos. They've decided to fly with it because the hatch is on the leeward side of the spacecraft during re-entry which means it doesn't tend to have high pressure plasma pushing in and potentially opening that up. It'll instead heat up gradually and hopefully expand to fill the gap. It's probably not a big thing but it was something they wanted to be sure of. 4th of March we had a Falcon 9 from Vandenberg and this was the Transporter 10 rideshare mission carrying over 50 payloads for multiple customers. Notable spacecraft on this flight include Methanesat, a satellite that's designed to look for localized methane emissions, perhaps from uh, you know resource extraction operations. It's notable that while this is hosted by the New Zealand Space Agency, it also got a lot of its funding from uh, environmental uh, like groups such as the Environmental Defence Fund and Jeff Bezos's Earth Fund. Um, there's Eros, which is Portugal's second satellite, the first in over 30 years, and it's nicely timed because there's new laws uh, that have been passed in Portugal which might enable launches from Portugal, and it is geographically well situated for this. Perhaps we will one say day see uh, rockets flying over Casablanca from uh, the south of Portugal. There's um, True Anomaly. They have a pair of 275 kilogram spacecraft named Jackal. Uh, these are supposed to rendezvous and investigate other satellites, space situational awareness, basically spying on other satellites. And they will be performing tests and demonstrations, trying to you know, dodge and then trying to chase and trying to rendezvous, all this good stuff. Uh, there's also a company called Atomos launching uh, Quark and Gluon, two spacecraft which will uh, fly around and rendezvous proximity operations, dock, transfer fuel, basically demonstrate the technology for on-orbit servicing of vehicles. Uh, Axel Space is launching a demonstrator for uh, their Pixis platform, uh, that's 150 kilos. Uh, Side to Space launched their first spacecraft, a Lizzie Sat one it's, uh, it'll host other payloads primarily. And uh, also Apex, same thing with their spacecraft design. It's okay. 4th of March, the third launch of 4th of March. Can you believe we spent all this time just one day? Few hours even, because uh, they launched a Starlink block 6-41 out of Florida. One hours and 51 minutes after the launch on the West Coast. So this is a very rapid turnaround of launches. And then there was nothing. It was all silent until the 11th of March when we had Starlink launching out of Florida right at dusk. Some amazing images of that. And also a few hours later, we were expecting a Starlink Group 7 to launch out of Vandenberg. It got pushed back a couple of hours so we didn't get the amazing fireworks over the sky upstaging the Oscars. But nevertheless, five launches in the last week, all of them from SpaceX. And after Crew X launched, the, uh, Crew 8, sorry, launched, they reached the space station, they have docked, they've said their greetings, hung out for a while, traded stories, learned how to drive the thing, and Crew 7 have just undocked from the ISS, and we expect them to land back on Earth tomorrow. Well, I mean, they're expected to land back in the ocean tomorrow and get transported to solid ground, but yeah, they're coming home. And NASA, in the last couple of weeks, they had a graduation ceremony for their latest group of astronaut candidates, Group 23, nicknamed The Flies. Twelve people, seven men, as two, five women, ten came from US applicants, and then there was two from the UAE who were, uh, you trained with them. So it may be some time before these newly minted astronauts get to fly. There is one member, Anil Menon, who is going to get to see his wife fly before him, and she's not even a NASA astronaut. They both worked at SpaceX, and Anna was one of the key people in making Inspiration4 happen. She is going to be flying on uh, Polaris Dawn, um, and obviously that means he, you know, Anil's going to have to take care of the kids. Uh, look, If we look back at uh, Group 22, we'll see that all of them have flown 
with one exception, and that is Johnny Kim. Johnny Kim is the guy that comes up whenever people used to complain about millennials being lazy or whatever, like taking all these stereotypes, and it's like, you know, he's like Navy SEAL, doctor, astronaut, all that stuff. For some reason, he hasn't got around to flying, uh, which is, you know, whatever. Also, from the group before that, in 2009, Jeanette Epps, she finally flew on Crew 8. If you remember, she was going to fly on Soyuz, and then there was some grumbling from Russia, and she came back, and... Uh, but yeah, she finally has flown, and uh, yeah, great going. But perhaps more importantly, for everybody out there that's dreaming of space flight, now that Class 23 has graduated, NASA are now taking applications for a new class of astronauts. You have until the end of the month to get your application in. You need to have, I think, at least a master's degree. You have to be a US citizen, and there's all sorts of other stuff that make you more qualified. So if you think this stuff sounds easy, you've watched all my videos, and clearly you're qualified, go on. You never know. The worst they can do is they can say no. And until they say no, you can tell your friends that you're an astronaut applicant and they haven't rejected you. Uh, over in Alaska, uh, ABL Space have been getting their rocket vertical at the launch site in Kodiak. Launch preps are underway for their second launch. If you remember the first launch, it was somewhat secret, but it basically failed after about 15 seconds into the flight and fell back, causing a fiery disaster. They're ready to go again, and I wish them every success. There's been a lot of news in the last week about Voyager 1 is dead! which isn't technically correct. So yes, this has been something that has, we've been watching since before Christmas. There was, what's happened is Voyager 1 has started sending back garbage. And as far as we can tell, we know that we can send commands to Voyager, so we can tell it to like reboot systems, switch over, things like that, and we can observe the results. But the problem is the results that are coming back are just garbage telemetry. There's multiple computers on Voyager. It's possible that something has got corrupted inside this specific data processor. And engineers at JPL are running out of ways to solve this problem. And I saw an interview where they basically said, yeah, we don't actually have a simulator for the spacecraft anymore. And that kind of blows my mind. Uh, I, I would love the documentation to write a Voyager simulator. Anyway, uh, back in, you know, non-simulated reality, <laughs> Astra... Astra is going to go private at a price of 50 cents per share. That is 1%, less than 1% of the value of the company at their peak. In fact, it's the 50 cent price that was offered is one third of the stock price at the time the deal was reached. So Astra have obviously managed to spend a lot of money and not actually gone very far. They're Spaceship engines, you know, that they acquired from Apollo Fusion, those haven't been coming out as fast as possible. There's definitely been some stories about how that was sort of mismanaged. They built this amazing production line to build rockets really, really quickly, and then the rockets kept on failing, so nobody wanted to buy rockets as quickly as they want. So, yeah, it sounds like the founders of the company have come up with a deal and some investment to get some cash infusion to bring the company private again and stop it turning into a complete fire sale. Uh, their argument is that this is more money than the shareholders would get if they didn't do this. But yeah, uh, not a great success at this point for investors. Over in the land of mainstream media, CBS is 60 Minutes. They did a whole thing on NASA returning to the moon. And while obviously we know a lot of the stuff that's going on here, because they are big you know, network media, they were able to do things like get inside Blue Origins factory. And we haven't seen many photos of stuff in there. I mean, so sure, this piece was really aimed at the average person and it didn't include a whole lot of stuff that we didn't know. Uh, it, I thought it was great that they actually talked to like the inspector general at NASA as well as the people in charge of the mission at NASA to get an idea of how the cost and everything is all supposed to work out. But yeah, the, the real revelation for Space Watchers was this Blue Origin segment. And notably, on camera, Blue Origin said that they basically planned to launch their lunar cargo mission in a year to a year and a half. So that is like putting a stake in the ground, a flag, a target, which you know, it'd be nice to actually see happen. 
And of course, another key part of NASA's return to the moon has been the builder of SLS, Boeing. And they have been appearing in the wrong kind of news stories for the last few weeks, mostly about their aircraft. But we were looking forward to Starliner flying next month. Look forward no longer because of parking issues at the International Space Station. They're going to have to push that out to May. Uh, what they're going to have to have is uh, the CRS-30 cargo mission is going to launch in March. It's going to dock to the station for a couple of months. After it departs, Crew 8 will have to undock their Dragon from the front of the station, move it over to the top. And then there will be room for Starliner to come up and hopefully, hopefully finally get this show on the road. But perhaps one of the coolest test flights in the last uh, few days has been Strato Launch. So Strato Launch, uh, they're, okay, they're not a space company. They were a space company. They were going to carry rockets on their ginormous aircraft, the Rock, which is like two 747s bolted together, more or less. Unfortunately, the principal investor Paul Allen died, and Elon Musk decided that he didn't want to like follow up with a handshake agreement to build a launch vehicle for it, and like backed out with the Falcon 5. So anyway, Strato Launch never got to launch rockets. Uh, the company got sold to an investor, and they wanted to get into hypersonics, which you know, hypersonics, pretty cool stuff, and they had their first launch of their Talon hypersonic test vehicle. I know this isn't space, but it, it's really space adjacent for many reasons. So we have footage of this little rocket plane dropping from underneath the strat, the rock and rocketing off into the distance. Now, we don't know how fast they go. According to the company, they will not disclose the top speed achieved on this flight because of proprietary agreements with partners. But we do know that the propulsion on this was provided by Ursa Major Technologies. Their engine is a oxygen-rich, closed-cycle, kerosene, liquid oxygen engine. It's the same engine that was supposed to be in the second stage of Astra's Rocket 4. This is the first test flight, as far as we can know, and it produced 5,000 pounds, you know, that would be 2,200 kilos of thrust, uh, for about 200 seconds. So this demonstrates that their engine works. It sounds like the customer is happy with it. So that's a good sign for anyone that is interested in Ursa Major's engines. I don't know if we're going to see any further flights or when we're going to see any further flights, but this is supposed to be one of these things that you can put your hypersonic payload on it and test it. Uh, yeah, uh, definitely interesting. They're also the company that bought uh, Virgin Orbit's you know, Cosmic Girl, and they've already gone and ruined it, repainted it, and whatever, but she'll always be Cosmic Girl to me. Uh, that may be an alternate way of launching it. I think Rock is actually kind of oversized for the Talon uh, aircraft that they're currently testing. But yes, the biggest test that we are looking forward to in the coming week, maybe a little longer than that, is Starship. Now, we've had... March 14th, published by SpaceX. There is not a launch site, a license for this. We have seen closures and claims and warnings that uh, March 14th may be the day. Obviously, that's Pi Day, so it'd be cool if they like put like a Pi payload on board. You know, after all, we had a big cheese fly on the first Falcon. Uh, yeah, a lot of progress is being made, but we haven't seen any official approvals. We've seen the Obviously, the stack stacked. We've seen stage zero testing the shower head, the, the flame deflector. We just had a spin prime test on the Starship. I expect we'll see an engine test, probably actually in the same test session. Um, so this is going to be another launch, another version of IFT-1 plan, where they go eastwards out over the Gulf of Mexico, thread between the various Caribbean islands, once they reach orbital speed, there is going to be some extra tests in here. They're going to open up the uh, like the pillbox, the PEZ dispenser, demonstrate that they can open and close this in flight. They're going to perform a maneuver, a relight of the engines while in orbit to demonstrate that deorbit capability is possible. Obviously, we are hoping to see a re-entry of the full thing. And we'd like to see some video of that. And we'd like to see the booster do its... Uh, flip back, burn back, and soft landing attempt over the Gulf of Mexico. But we don't know how far we're going to get into that. But once again, excitement is going to be guaranteed. But we're just not sure about that March 14th date. And I think at this point, it may well be delayed. Another sort of relevant Starship uh, test that was announced or you know, disclosed was that they've actually completed testing of the docking system. So 
for the moon landing, right, Artemis 3, they will have to rendezvous with an Orion spacecraft in lunar orbit, potentially lunar halo to orbit, but there's, you know, yeah, it'll probably be a new lunar halo orbit, and they'll have to, you know, perform docking. So basically they've taken the Dragon docking hardware and they've verified that this is actually going to work correctly in uh, on the Starship and be able to perform as the active or the passive in this case. So that's a that's another one of many tests that have demonstrated. I think the same article mentioned that SpaceX has achieved over 30 milestones on their uh, demonstration of the human landing system. So while Starship hasn't reached orbit, it's not like there are, haven't been many, many successful tests to demonstrate SpaceX's uh, you know, plan for HLS on the moon. And so, yeah, that's, uh, that's a week over. As I said, look forward to Starship. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.